Hi there. This past Wednesday, Netflix released the first full trailer for Three Body Problem, alongside a big press event with showrunners Benioff and Weiss at Consumer Electronics Show. This was the return of Benioff and Weiss to the public eye, and their first big interview since the post-season 8 Game of Thrones backlash in 2019. They returned with an in-depth interview with a panel of TV critics and career journalists from The New York Times, The Atlantic, Variety, and Deadline, in which they displayed a surprising level of transparent candor discussing behind-the-scenes issues on Game of Thrones, as well as their detailed approach to adapting the Three Body Problem novels, which, while critically acclaimed, are notoriously dense, cerebral, and genre-bending hard sci-fi in the style of Arthur C. Clarke. Overall, it led me to reassess a lot of my previously held biases about Benioff and Weiss since we last saw them in public over four years ago. And overall at this panel, they expressed a lot of profound ideas on the art of screenwriting and presented themselves as exemplars of professional comportment. I'm being sarcastic. There was no panel of veteran TV critics and professional journalists. They did a one-on-one -on -one puff piece interview with, you guessed it, their usual mouthpiece, James Hibbard, who now works at The Hollywood Reporter instead of Entertainment Weekly, and that's where they gave the interview. Observe. The last time I Googled myself was season two of Game of Thrones, and I've never done it since. And apparently everyone loved it from then on, so I'm happy. To the best of my knowledge. That's what Dan told me. Yeah. Hi, I'm David Benioff. I'm Dan Weiss. And I'm Alex Wu. We're here with The Hollywood Reporter, and we're going to play The Last Time I. The last time I wrote a script I was proud of would be this season of, of uh, Three Body Problem. I would say the same. That was the video that accompanied the article. The actual article, written by James Hibbard, begins not just blaming viewers for the backlash to season eight in a line or two, but opens with spending a full paragraph outright demeaning the basic validity of these criticisms, at some length. To quote, the writer-producers had made the biggest TV hit of the 21st century and the most Emmy-winning drama of all time, and it was their very first show. HBO's Thrones had a spectacular eight-season run, a global phenomenon that was reputationally marred by a 2019 final season that fans loudly considered disappointing. In the online space, at least. Benioff and Weiss's obsessive day-and-night efforts to pull off a production that was unprecedented in its difficulty were shrugged aside. Psychologists call this the peak-end rule. How people feel about the end of something tends to color how they feel about all of it, and many fans felt raw about the end of Thrones. Normal people don't talk like this, much less professional quote-unquote journalists. Now, I can see how an interviewer might brush aside in one sentence. You know, I didn't expect them to criticize it or anything. They're not going to have a Perry Mason moment. But I thought there'd be, like, a line at the beginning going, despite a controversial final season, and then move on to talking about Three Body Problem. Instead, they spend time talking about Game of Thrones to double down on how, no, everything was amazing. And I've seen people saying, oh, no, well, the last seasons were bad because they ran out of books or production things, shifting blame from Benioff and Weiss. Benioff and Weiss have never said that the later seasons through the final season were nothing short of perfection. You are making excuses that they themselves don't. You can't have it both ways. They own it. They double down on, how dare you say this wasn't a perfect season. Best season ever. This, he opens with spending this much time, this much space, a full paragraph on all of this, so I want to break it down. What does that phrase even mean? <laughs> Reputationally marred? It, it wasn't actually marred, but according to some, it has the reputation of being marred. No one talks like that. This is not professional. It, it, it's the equivalent, I mean, it's, it's a synonym as if he had said it was allegedly marred by a final season would have been a little insulting, but 
the level of disdain in that specific word choice, not just allegedly, but reputationally, it was marred, but not really. It, and he even says it was fans loudly complaining that they insist that the criticism wasn't even that widespread, but that only a few people who didn't like it were disproportionately vocal. That it's this vocal minority of, they always blame the toxic fans are after us. And that next line here, in the online space at least, all that work was shrugged aside. All that work was shrugged aside. Benny Offenweiss's obsessive day and night efforts. You jackass! They didn't come to the season 8 night shoots. And they have the, the temerity to claim I was working really hard. If you haven't seen it, I posted a highlight reel of about 20 minutes worth of clips from that last watch documentary, the, the documentary they put out for season eight, and they accidentally didn't realize that we hired a third party documentary team to follow the crew around as opposed to just the top people. And they wanted to show how hard everyone was working and it backfired because it showed how much they were suffering needlessly. And the, Kit Harrington, I have a clip in there spliced in. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's the cover video for my channel. Kit Harrington saying on late night talk shows and not joking, Benioff and Weiss skipped all the night shoots and they drop in once a week or so to visit on these 60 day night shoots for two months and everyone would be glaring at them for abandoning them. That isn't hard work. And as we've seen with the writer's strike, writing is, an, is something through re rewrites is something that goes on through the end of filming. That yes, you need the screenwriter, showrunner on set because nothing ever goes perfectly to plan. They will need to make adjustments. And another clip I'm going to share in the description box below. Check out the last watch thing. I would splice it in here, but for copyright reasons, I don't want to get in trouble again. But I already I had to win a copyright strike to get this posted because Austin Film Fest wanted it taken down. But someone sneaked in an audio recording of at that big. Austin Film Fest panel, their last public appearance, October 2019, they openly joked about how little they worked on season 8 filming. Maybe not the writing part, but there's this point where they crack jokes about, and I, I have this as a standalone clip, where the, the naive um, moderator is asking, wow, season 8, 60 days worth of night shoots sure were a lot of work. And he goes, just sarcastically, sure was for our director and our cast and crew. We weren't even there. And it's like, they're proud of this. And he explains, well, we knew that the writing is done. We don't need a lot of work to do anymore. There's, there's no reason for us to be there. When, like I said, the strike has shown us that, no, you need the writers there through the end doing rewrites. When something unexpected comes up, they need to alter things. And that just they abandoned their crew after mistreating them. So and they're, they're like the prosthetics head of the prosthetics department, Gower, she is crying about how little she sees her family. They are working these people to the bone. They're saying we are working 18 hours a day, mostly at night, seven days a week. We feel like vampires that they did not put a lot of work into this. And you are claiming you had obsessive day and night efforts that the sheer amount of work, and this is something that is they've done more than once. This is a tactic Hibbard tries to do as a PR guy. Um, it came up in the Last Watch documentary. The whole He wasn't in that, though. The whole point was, show how much work went into this so we dare not criticize it or else say that the cast and crew's sacrifices were for nothing. Well, yeah, I'm unafraid to say that because it's your fault, not mine. You are the one who wasted their time. And they, it's they're playing on the sunk cost fallacy that I think a lot of the cast and crew themselves are unwilling to admit that season eight was bad. A lot of them do know, but the other ones that reputationally, because we'd have to admit that it was all for nothing and people were stunned. I think it happens to a lot of fans too. And Hibbert did the same thing in that insulting PR book he did. You might not have heard of it because it was after season eight and people weren't paying attention anymore. But the year after that, he put out this book praising Benioff and Weiss, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. And a lot of it was devoted to saying, look how much the cast and crew sacrificed. Look at the work went into this. Don't criticize it. But he never really cited work that Benioff and Weiss themselves were doing. 
I mean, I know writing isn't a physical thing, but in terms of planning work, other people who did planning work type things, like the directors, the set designer, we're saying all the planning work and frustrations that went into it, they never actually provide quotes of Benioff and Weiss themselves handling it. That level of planning work, it's always other, look at all the work Deborah Riley did. And then passing it off as if, and this is work that went into it, it wasn't from Benioff and Weiss themselves. Obsessive day and night efforts. And if you go to, I, I'm posting a screenshot here, again, copyright reasons. Kit Harrington saying they didn't come to the night shoots and abandoned us. And then, watch the clip separately from this. Them joking, we didn't feel the need to go be there at night because, oh, well, why should we suffer? Because your crew is suffering, and they're acting like, well, there wasn't work to do. There's always advice to have. I mean, they even, like, they knew there was a job to be done because they said Benioff and Weiss weren't there, Coggan wasn't there, Dave Hill, the fourth writer guy, was their representative. And the, we have things of, of directors and, and crew going back and forth to Dave Hill and saying how much they were arguing with him over decisions he ma needed to make that he didn't know how to do. When, yes, there, there needed to be oversight on these things, the fact that you delegated it to someone else is an admission that there was a task to do. But th this is not surprising, I shouldn't be upset, but this is what they always did. Claim they were working really hard, and just, this is laying the shit on pretty heavy. In the online space, at least, all that work was shrugged aside. Benioff and Weiss's obsessive day and night efforts... It's like that Simpsons thing. How dare you say I'm lazy? I came into work, Homer, three times. Twice you were napping, and once you were eating snacks. I haven't seen you working. <laughs> you know? And the next line here. Tries to cite... He, he's trying to cite, like, pseudo-intellectual psychology at us. Psychologists call this the peak end rule of sour grape. No, this is sour grapes, the opposite of that. That, that you want to convince us, oh, well, I, I didn't even want it in the first place. It was all, it, it was as good as it's going to be. Psychologists call this the peak end rule, that the end retroactively color, it colors it. No. People who were giving you a pass since it went bonkers in season five with the controversial Sansa rave, and I keep repeating that because it defined the show. It was in the New York Times reporting on the controversy. All the other bonkers shit that this is when the book fan sites gave up on the show, that Westeros Dork said, we are done with this. Book fandom gave up on them, what are you doing in season five? Which was such a hard turn after, like, season four. It was stunning. That news sites who were even giving you a pass after the bonkers fifth and sixth and even seventh seasons, compartmentalizing, it'll all be worth... I, I saw people saying that. They were rushing those s minor subplots to focus on the main plot of the prince that was promised in the White Walker stuff. And they, they'd actually articulate this at some length. Well, they're focusing on the Daenerys and John White Walker plot line. And then when Arya kills the Night King, and they never even mention that Jon Snow's heritage, secret heritage, who is Jon Snow's mother, the prince that was promised, when none of that mattered, and the White Walkers, are even, even if they had, they were defeated in a single battle and really didn't impact the story that... Any book fans who gave up on the show and were just, you know, watching to, to report on it, like me, more than one person I've seen who felt this show is insane and they're gaslighting me that this is the best show ever after season five. When they saw Arya killing the Night King with groups of people and other people were gasping at it, they burst out laughing. That's what I did. I burst out laughing because I knew, I knew that all of the excuses broke in, in, into tiny pieces of glass and fell away. That you, you, Just as the White Walkers disintegrated, it's a metaphor that all of the excuses and lies fell away, that no, no, we're the compartmentalizing, they sacrificed that story to focus on this one. And then they didn't. Because every season, another big thing leading up to season eight was the false promise that next season will make it better is a big thing, and that was stringing people along. That's why so many people said, can we have a ninth season to retroactively fix it? And it's like, even if they did, it couldn't fix it. You can't, re other than rebooting it, you can't just fix things with, oh, the Sansa rape, they'll make it better next season. How? Dorn, how? When did they ever 
revive a storyline that had gotten bad. They, n they never did. So all these people who were basically in denial, strung along with that false promise, not all of them, and maybe not even a majority, unfortunately, a lot of people don't think about it at all. They're just angry but don't know how to articulate it. But a fairly large number who were making excuses through Season 8 couldn't make excuses anymore. And while they have it, I think you need to have this long-form, I'm annoyed the media hasn't done this, assessed, you know, in retrospect, these guys never knew what they were doing, This they sold us a lie, Season 5, the media should have turned on them more, but didn't, we were making excuses. Hasn't really happened yet. But even then, this is just Hibbard quoting nonsense as, of, oh, that's just... Hindsight bias of, oh, the, the, the peak end rule that people will look back at. This is a full paragraph, the starting paragraph, of him insulting the fans more than he needs to. And again, his book, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon, was like this for page after page. Came out a year after the show. The few, the few channels who were left analyzing it was really weird. He had this bizarre, pompous, and lecturing tone which had a need not just to react to criticism, and it wasn't trying to react to it point by point with counter-arguments, it was just demeaning and insulting it, to humiliate it, like, well, stupid people think this. And, and other times it would be frequent alternating with gushing about how wonderful Benioff and Weiss are, putting them on a pedestal, outright saying how brave and bold their decisions were, their daring choices. And without emotion, step back and realize, this is the point of this specific video, it's part of a series. We aren't the target audience for these things anymore. We weren't the target audience for Hibbard's book. We are not the target audience of this article. You know, who would have read his book? Who would have meant to read who was meant to read this? Hibbard is writing these propaganda pieces praising Benioff and Weiss to be read by Benioff and Weiss. So they come back, give another Puff Peeps interview, and he gets clicks for his articles. And that's a big point, that they're laying the shit on so heavy, because it's not about convincing us anymore. It's about praising Benioff and Weiss to their face. Hibbard's writing and writing like it like this, this has stopped even being useful propaganda. I, I shouldn't even call it propaganda anymore, because that implies it's meant to turn public opinion. Would this, I mean, in, in, gen, in genuine seriousness, and the comments tell me, would do you feel this changed people's opinions about them? The way it's written? And this is, they're telling, he's telling them the narrative they want to hear about what happened. And putting it out in public. And this isn't the only time, like that other HBO book about HBO, Tinderbox, was so full of self-praise. They commissioned their own history book about HBO, the people who just got fired when AT&T bought it that another book by other journal real journalists felt compelled to be made as this point-by-point -point reaction to Tinderbox, saying this, this is blatantly just praising HBO, that a hagiography is a saint's life book in, in, in religion and stuff. They basically commissioned their own hagiography, or um, uh, the, the Simpsons analogy I, I remember is Krusty the Clown's autobiography was very self-serving with many glaring omissions. This was in the 90s, so I asked my parents, what, is it, what does he mean by that? And they said, it's sort of like if O.J. Simpson wrote an autobiography and then left out the white Bronco car chase and focused on his NFL career. <laughs> that thing. That instead of writing it himself, they hired a, a, someone to write a book praising them. And it's like, this isn't even turning public opinion anymore. You wrote it, you are the audience. All this is, so this is exactly like what his book was, uh, Hibbert's book. Um, the real heroes here are shout out to um, Lord Commander Dunn's channel that they uh, did this chapter because we had nothing else to do in 2021, 2022 pandemic lockdown. Over Discord, um, they had this chapter by chapter read through and analysis of it because there's some real gems in it and just information we wouldn't have known otherwise. And they posted them as long-form podcasts on his YouTube channel. I guessed it on one of them about the stunt safety accidents in Season 7. I just jumped in, but they put a lot of time and effort into that because there wasn't much other news. Filming hadn't started yet in the prequel. That that book was so utterly bizarre, and this is beyond the pale. 
Not that Benioff and Weiss are dismissing criticism, I understand that. And in the actual article, it's really not them personally saying quotable things. They say generic things like, well, you know, you can't please everyone, and you know it's never going to be 100%, and, you know, it's upsetting when people are angry like it. I step back and I'm not angry at what they said, because that's the usual deflection, right? I mean, it wasn't anything particularly insulting. And what do you expect them to say? That they admitted no guilt, they stand by what they did, but just a generic, hey, you can't please everyone, you know. But it wasn't like quotable or something or particularly insulting. The weirdest parts are the parts where it's Hibbard writing. And realize this is all pre-scripted and they probably worked out with Benioff and Weiss. Or at least when he asked some questions, key point, when he asked them questions, he's feeding them questions. This is all, the big point is, this is a scripted act. Like when we saw, Hibbert did this, the, and I have a clip of this, tell me if you remember in the comments, the insulting Season 8 final Comic-Con, the final San Diego Comic-Con panel, where stupidly, because Hibbert was moderating it, he did the same interview earlier in the day, and stupidly posted that video to public, like around lunchtime. And then later at night, he did a second interview with the same set of cast members at the panel, the Comic-Con panel, and it was literally the same questions and answers. Oh, well, I guess Brand's rule won't be a barrel of monkeys, and, uh, uh, well, who got to... It just, it was, it wasn't just pre-scripted, we had video that it was pre-rehearsed. <laughs> and you got to see how this is all, this isn't them meeting the fans. Comic-Con has turned into just fake soft questions and they're going through it's exactly like i like the phrase the cringeworthy banter that you see at award shows where you you can tell this is prescriptive the golden globes just happened the emmys are tonight where th this is obviously not real so like the cringeworthy quote-unquote interviews at, at award shows this whole hollywood reporter thing with hibbard this is play acting for the cameras trying to be the triumphant return of the Benioff and Weiss show. And I said in my other video, when I say the Benioff and Weiss show, I don't mean three-body problem, I mean the meta show of the the scripted, cringeworthy, back-and-forth banter with an obvious plant moderator with a soft interviewer like Hibbard. The meta show, even the inside the episodes, you eventually realize when they're saying, like, and this was so amazing in season eight that it's pre scripted. So it's that meta show they were uh, chilling for us. Benioff's public image is very carefully choreographed and everything is scripted and intentional. I don't mean this angry. I'm just saying mentally step back from your anger and realize even when he's kind of saying something that's insulting to you, he thinks this makes him look good because he's dismissing his critics or he's acting very confident and like nothing gets to him. That every little thing is it's choreographed, the back and forth, it is scripted and intentional. This is framed. That these aren't spur-of-the-moment remarks. They, they thought of it ahead of time. That thing where he goes, oh yeah, I haven't read online comments in two years. He pre-screened or outright came up with all the questions in this. He, he wanted to send that as a message to the world. Self-consciously, not just, oh, f spur of the moment I was dismissive. The day before he did this, he knew I'm going to go in and crack a line about, I, don't, I haven't even listened to anything since season two. He, ha he probably has a little, you understand. I'm not saying he has a lot, but just he is saying that to be dismissive of his critics. I don't even read your stuff. Who knows if that's, that's true? It doesn't matter. He wants to demean us. Understand that he is pretending he wasn't paying attention to be dismissive. He didn't forget. It, he's acting like he forgot. And he does this all the time. Not just here, but in other contexts. And I think it's one of those things that's like a habit, one of the tactics of a toxic boss, I guess. Not just with us, the fans, but with cast and crew, that I wonder how much he did this to the cast or his assistants. When a cast member is saying this is wrong for my character or something, when he wants to send a message that he's dismissive and your opinion doesn't matter, he acts like a bored student in a classroom. 
or acts like it was so insignificant that it was beneath his notice and he forgot. Oh, uh, oh, wait, yeah, I get, was there something about, I'm talking Benioff's voice, was there something about a, 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 some actor for Barristan or maybe Dario who maybe voiced some complaints about that you didn't like what we killing off his character? I, I don't really remember who it was. Like, he knows damn well that it was the Barristan Selmy actor. He, he, he's going through that whole play act of, well, I don't really remember, to be dismissive. This is all an act. You know, step back and go, this is all plan. Not just the answers, but the fake questions. And key point here, what the heck kind of soft questions were these? I mean, in the video part, the, the text I'm going to go through actually does ask questions. They're obviously scripted, but they're at least things you'd think should come up. Like, question, what questions are these that they put in the video part? What was the last time you Googled yourself? What was the last script you were proud of? And I guess maybe they thought the video part should be funny. But again, the, the oh, well, we did videos of the fun questions. These aren't real questions. They're lines that Benioff himself probably pre-scripted, or at least Hibbard told them before they recorded it. Like, he knew every... He was feeding them lines, like he did at Comic-Con. That this isn't an interview, it's a PR promo. Think of it like on Amazon's The Boys. That's the other big example I use. When Homelander makes a propaganda video... The quote-unquote interviewer is reciting leading pre-scripted lines. Hey, Homelander, can you tell us what it's like being so awesome? He told them to ask that, or they're trying to promote him and craft his public image. The text part had a bit more on, on topics. They were still weird, but this is all about sending a message. If you've watched all of... Benioff's video performances in the meta show of this is a play act for the cameras when he does an interview. They're not real interviews, particularly since season five, and there actually weren't that many public appearances when he did it was heavily scripted. Uh, a huge one is that Oxford Union panel they made right before season five, and this is all play acting, or when he's at Comic-Con the few times he went, it's all the same routine. We know very little of Benioff the real person, that this is for the cameras, and he's even described this, that the first big part is, there's like three things here, act swaggering and casual with easygoing confidence, in order to ignore the elephant in the room, just be, hey, I'm confident, nothing gets to me, confident, 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 and talking in a warm voice and easygoing, and I remember the live tweeter at Austin Film Fest even remarked on this, that he has this calm, nonchalant tone and it's charismatic and inviting, but the actual verbal content of what he's saying, the, the informational content of his words is an abomination, they said. I just, oh, you noticed that too, that he's just, say it in a relaxed voice. And he's learned this by rote, you understand, it's an act. There is the, the training it needs for public speaking to act confident but casual. And it works surprisingly well on people. It reminds me of the voice in Dune, where you, people are just inherently trusting of people who talk in a friendly voice, even when the information he's saying is gibberish. And throughout the clip I showed, if you go and see the whole thing in this, there's like five minutes of it, it's just him being friendly. Same thing happened at Austin Film Fest, except it was to a room full of screenwriters who realized what he's saying is deeply offensive. And he's even described what it's like going into what I call Benioff mode in public, his public persona. That, that, that It's another clip I have in the Last Watch documentary where he goes, I puffed myself up and acted really confident. He, he makes this gesture of puffing himself up, acting really confident, talking to Martin, and saying, and I guess I just came off as so confident that it convinced him I knew what I was talking about. Like, there, there's clips of him saying that that's part of his routine. Other stuff he does, another second thing is where he described of act flippant and dismissive if there's a criticism. Well, I don't even remember that. Was it something, it's beneath, I'm, I'm, or act bored with it. And it's just, have you been on a debate club? Have you noticed that, like, one of the things is a tactic is to act bored or like the, like the other side is being something insignificant when, like, we're talking about stunt safety violations or you're going over budget or you know, hard things, facts that he can't just brush away. He will... It, it, the few examples we have of this, it's surprising how he was able to do that. Another thing he'll do, uh, he hasn't done this frequently, is he'll uh, he'll resort to cold reading, 
where he'll th mumble through a bunch of variant answers, and because the moderator wants to believe him, he'll wait for the moderator to pick one, and then he'll focus on it. Like when at, at Oxford Union he was asked, what's going on with that Jamie Searcy sex scene? He rambled between, uh, well, you know, it was a hard day on, on the set, and, you know, they're complicated characters, and, you know, the books, and they said, oh, you're saying it's because they show their complicated characters? Yeah, that's it. It's, you're volunteering him answers. He gave you multiple choices and he zeroes in. That's what cold reading is. He doesn't do that that much, but it's really silly when you see him act that it was caught on camera, that we saw him doing that. But that's not even the main one. It's act really swaggering and confident. That's not even his real persona. He said, I'm trying to do that to power my way through, that you want to be him. That he's so confident that he must know what he's talking about. You know, the, the confidence of a mundane man failing upwards from privilege, I guess. But that, or be dismissive. The one that actually really insults me the most, which isn't even, you know, technically bad, is, I'm sorry to share this, it's what I call the coy toddler routine. That And it is purely meant as a joke, he's not even trying to dismiss anyone where he thinks he's hilarious when he acts almost sar when he'll almost sarcastically respond maybe or oh, I don't know to a question that's obvious like and not a controversial question like if you ask wow game of thrones won a lot of emmy awards he'll deadpan in a flat voice of sincerity oh maybe uh, I don't know oh, do you think so I guess and it's like not the way me, I would go, oh, you yell a lot in your videos. I go, oh, really? You think so? Which is sarcasm. It's, sorry, it's just I watch so many of these videos and it's the same joke over and over again. Oh, maybe, I don't know. That, that mock like a toddler would go, maybe. Sorry to bring that up so much. He acts like that a little in this video. And if you thought the Benioff and Weiss show was over, get ready for that again. That's just a sense of humor. And tell me the comments. I'm struggling to verbalize. Now I'm at the end of this section. I've heard people already saw this saying he acts really smug in this. And I go, yeah, but how do you qualify that? I mean, not just he acted really smug. If this was in a book where you only had text to go on, not what he said in the video or even a transcript, uh, how would you describe what makes what he said and the way he said it smug? I have difficulty actually verbalizing. I'd like to hear you guys tell me what makes it smug. I'm struggling maybe acting with coy mock humility as a joke, which gets very grating after a while, or ooze confidence so people want to be me or trust me. Maybe. I have difficulty verbalizing what makes it smug. And it's kind of fascinating. And keep in mind, like I said, all of this is curated, all of this is scripted out by PR guys like Homelander's Handlers. Or like when Jonathan Majors has an apology tour for all of his recent scandals, and you can tell he's play-acting, that when people are doing that on camera, like people in scandals having apology tours, everything is scripted down to their clothes. Everything in this is scripted, and like Benioff is actually quite the fashion plate, but they're dressed down casual here, that, that whole business casual thing, like, I know you're a powerful executive. But he's trying to send a message of, I'm one of the guys, because I have this pseudo blue-collar denim look. This isn't even how he's looked in a, a couple of other interviews. That He is trying to go for this ab unassuming look, and it's all part of the act. Oh, a few other quotes to go over, that's why I, I want to really go over here. New slide. Yet before signing on, Alexander Wu, the writer from True Blood that they hired, had a chat with Thrones co-executive producer Brian Cogman and asked him what it's really like to work with Benioff and Weiss. Brian said, you won't find a single person who worked on Game of Thrones with a single bad thing to say about either of them. They're genuinely great, decent people. And it goes on, it goes on. It's a quote that's likely to rile those who snark about Benioff and Weiss on Twitter and Reddit. And to be fair, not all the online acrimony is about their creative decisions. Benioff and Weiss can sometimes come off as dismissive of fan feelings, even if they privately agree with a criticism. Okay, everything in this article is intentional. Hibbert is choosing to put this out as propaganda or praise of them, selected carefully. But it's a bit on, too much on the nose. 
I asked their sidekick Cogman what's it like working with them, and he said they're amazing. I asked their, their assistant Cogman what it's like to work with them, and they said, oh, he's actually really amazing and warm. That would have been one thing to say, and you kind of expect them to say that, right? He went above and beyond that with this, not just, oh, they're really great to work with, but you won't find a single person with a single bad thing to say about them. That's setting the bar really high. And first off, the cast hasn't openly turned on them yet, admittedly. Like the way Ray Fisher eventually openly turned on Joss Whedon. But because they still live in fear of him. This is like that point, again, use the Joss Whedon Justice League analogy, where Ray Fisher was the only one really criticizing it, and like Gal Gadot, Jason Momoa were silent, but eventually they did, and said, I didn't speak up sooner for fear of reprisal. <laughs> well, you won't hear a single thing from my cast who live in fear of me. Uh, not just Whedon, other figures, like that Scott Rudin producer, who is a decades-long history, he, unrelated to this, but he had infamous stories of him as this toxic boss literally throwing things at his assistants. He sounds like some ravening beast, not a Broadway producer, a movie producer. And up to the point that these reports came out, like a cult, everyone around him would insist how amazing and kind he was, because they lived in fear of retaliation. And even then, okay, that's point one, they live in fear. Point two, we can cite examples of cast and crew from Game of Thrones criticizing them, particularly for season eight. And not to the Ray Fisher level, but we have clips of them saying this, like Deborah Riley saying the production schedule on season eight is delusional. And, and, and Sapochnik also criticizing it in the season eight last watch documentary, or again, in the montage of clips I made of it, I added in late night talk show of Kit Harrington pointing out they didn't go to night shoots, even though it was grueling for us and we were deeply offended by it that they didn't come to support us or help us. That is a criticism. <laughs> uh, and again, now that I think about it, who is the target audience? Hibbard's praise is so tone deaf here that this isn't effective as propaganda. And I'm all surprised he didn't cite, I, I'm genuinely surprised he didn't cite as an example, top of my head, when Amelia Clark, remember that Amelia Clark red carpet thing where they asked, how season eight? She got this scared look in her eyes, this pleading look, and said, best season ever, in a falsetto voice. And, and you could tell she was worried, and it became a whole meme. I am, Hibbert's writing here is so tone deaf, I'm openly surprised he didn't cite that as an example of an actor praising them, when she was clearly being sarcastic. Oh look, Amelia has nothing but nice things to say about them, best bosses ever, while her eyes are pleading for help. All of this is to be expected, of course, I'm not surprised, I'm just, I guess the word is disappointed at how ham-fisted Hibbert's praise was. Again, it's not surprising this whole book is like this. Nothing changed. The Benioff and Weiss show is back. The meta show of them getting Puff Beast interviews, which are really promo appearances, genuinely ha handled by James Hibbard, and things are going to get weird from now through the next three months through Three Body Problem as they make this promotional tour with heavily scripted interviews, which are really promos on, on the whole circuit, canned answers, and this is not accountability. And worst of all, and it's not just that Hibbert is praising them, if they ever do something on a real, you know, like, news uh, thing, like CNN did a thing with them, that was 60 Minutes, or Variety or something, they're going to brush off questions, and the interviewer is going to be too afraid to grill them. We never had a reckoning with any of this. It, even by comparison, like, Justice League, it took four years there eventually was a reckoning, that the real reckoning for Joss Whedon, when the whole cast came out and said what Ray Fisher is saying is true, that took four years, until 2021. Similarly, Game of Thrones' final season was four years ago. And it's weird, you, you have to think of how long these things take for people to openly speak out against them, that even in 2021, people were going, oh, Justice League was four years ago. It was such so impactful, and so many people cared about it, that you can't brush it off. I've seen people saying, you know, these past four years while I was building up for House of the Dragon, oh, why are you worried about something that happened three years ago? Benioff and Weiss are old news. 
And I said, because they said they got a development deal with Netflix, they're not going away because the reputation of Game of Thrones is so tainted by them that people were openly hesitant whether they would support a prequel show at all. From a point of practicality, it nearly destroyed the franchise that you need to say this was Joss Whedon's fault in order to put people's faith back in, you know, DC Comics movies that people were, weren't really keen on having more in the aftermath of that because the last one was so bad. It happens all the time with different franchises. And all the people... And the other things, like it's settled in as a meme. Like last year, I was really upset when people... They wouldn't bring it up a lot when they did, oh, you know, the show is just bad because it ran out of books. I should be happy they're doing this, and I kind of am. I mean, it's upsetting, but... Like I said going into this, I said this a year ago, when their next big show comes out, it will force all this back into the public eye. And that there was never an accountability or reckoning for it. Similarly, the Joss Whedon stuff came out when he was running the Nevers. That he took a couple of years off, then came back to run the Nevers for HBO, this big new Joss Whedon show. And it brought, whereas Whedon was out of the public eye for a while, it brought all the criticisms to the forefront again. Direct comparison with that, that Benioff and Weiss having a big new flagship show will hopefully bring up, will force the online media, the real news media and new journalists, to confront that just as four years passed and we didn't hold Whedon accountable for Justice League, we made up excuses for Benioff and Weiss. We never just said, oh, season eight is bad or season five is bad, but specific technical things they were getting wrong, like you're micromanaging the actors, you're blatantly rewriting characters just to get Emmy Awards to pad your own resume, because if Kit won an award, it would look good on them to launch their movie careers. All of this will be uh, forced back into the public eye, and hopefully people will be listening now to what I've been saying for so long. Obviously, to keep the franchise alive, I had to back burner that to focus on promoting House of the Dragon. You know, House of the Dragon analysis, casting reports, all of that stuff. I haven't been really covering them since, like, summer of 2020, because I realized they're not going anywhere until their next show comes out. We need to focus on reviving this as an on-air franchise with a successful prequel. That's one half of it. The other half is getting back to all the behind-the-scenes dirt on you let them do this to a major fantasy franchise and the insulting level of writing on it. And not just, oh, it was bad, oh, Justice League is bad, is this was utterly sexist, you were throwing around rape stuff to, to get awards, and it is insulting at the art of storytelling through the medium of television was lowered by them. And all of this, the, the flattery directly for Benioff, all this is from Austin Film Fest, you see it as a through line through all of that. This will bring it back up. But, oh geez, I'm already too far into this. And again, I'm going to cover this by other topics. Not going a full 60 minutes, and I'm like 45 minutes into this. The one last thing that he said in the, uh, in the interview, and I'm going to cover other things, and this is a long interview in THR, Hollywood Reporter, but the thing that closes the entire article happens to be the thing I'm going to close this topic on. The absolute last quote is, after spending the whole article insisting that Benioff and Weiss are unfazed and unconcerned by anything, that they're not acting humble, or you wouldn't expect them to if you had fantasies of that. They're doing their whole, I'm so confident, I'm unfazed, I don't even watch the, the stuff since season two. Not just for season eight, though, but for other things, like their career has taken other hits. There's other points where they act like, oh, well, you win some, you lose some when we lost our Star Wars movie deal. That was a major loss for them. That was a major setback to their careers. That was not going to the script they wanted. After spending this entire long article trying to play off, this is uh, us being amazing, we are oozing confidence and dismissive unconcern, they don't frame this as their comeback because that implies they lost. They just, we're so confident we're ready to do this. Hibbard stupidly ends it with the final line, the final paragraph of the, of the article, is a quote by John Bradley admitting that this is a comeback they desperately need. <laughs> read it off here. 
Bradley, who has gotten to know Benioff and Weiss pretty well since they plucked him out of obscurity as a working class actor for Thrones. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the article. They plucked him out of obscurity as a working class actor, so he's very loyal to them. But Bradley says he hopes Three Body Problem doesn't just become a hit, but serves as a redemption of sorts. Bradley, they're quite aware lightning striking once is rare enough. They know there's such a greater degree of expectation on them than on Thrones because they have a reputation to uphold now, whereas they were unknowns when Thrones started. Certain people who still have an certain people who still have an attitude towards Thrones are maybe looking to see them not hit the mark this time. Hello, that's in the back of Benioff and, and that's in the back of David and Dan's mind, because how could it not be? I think people are going to see this, uh, Brad, John Bradley. I think people are going to see this and reevaluate them and realize just how great they always were. Let that sink in. I think people are going to see this and reevaluate Benioff and Weiss and realize how wrong they were and what great genius showrunners they always were. It's going to provoke a lot of people right and maybe a few people wrong. They're still trying to break, break the boundaries with television. It's just. You don't spend a whole thing saying how unfazed and confident they are and then end with another person saying, actually, I'm pretty sure they're, they're rattled by this and know they need a comeback. That it, it's self-defeating! Uh, Bradley, he's a complete sellout. I told you, I've seen videos of him sobbing, I owe my career to them. And this is that classic abuser tactic, you are nothing without me. But it's the same thing from Hibbard's book, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon that half the time Hibbard was trying to mix putting Benioff on a pedestal to almost superhuman levels. While other parts of the book, sometimes jarringly uh, the next page or the same page, would alternate, you know, like in the next paragraph, trying to get sympathy by saying, instead of a Benny, one paragraph would say, Benioff is a bold genius who daringly figured out how to film on an Iceland glacier in one week with no prior training. He's this savant who intuitively, he's just a genius, he instinctively knows everything. Only to then, in literally the next paragraph, shift to trying to earn sympathy by saying, Benioff was faced with a monumental task of filming on a glacier, and a lot of extras and stuntmen got frostbite because of poor planning, but... Look at the sheer scale of all these hundreds of people. It was too much for one man. Don't you feel bad for Benioff and sympathize with him? And, I mean, pick a lane, Hibbard. It, 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 sometimes on the same page, it would shift between trying to do both. He is this amazing expert, or things went bad that were beyond his control, or sympathize that he was out of his depth because he's actually not that experienced. It, they cancel each other out. Even if you read Hibbard's stuff, and this article is exactly like that, that it happens to be the very beginning and the very end, are begins with, look how confident they are, and ends with actually someone going, uh, this is the comeback story. It isn't a coherent false narrative. He's not just crafting a false narrative. It's incoherent and just going for even contradictory things they're trying to argue. So, yes, as Bradley said... They are rattled in private. They are rattled. If you started this video upset and daunted by how confident they seem, no, that is an act. They're not totally defeated. They were able to pass off Season 8 as, well, that's Season 8, but we're failing upwards to Star Wars now, so it doesn't matter. And they even managed to sidestep being booted off Star Wars into, well, we just got a $200 million development deal with Netflix. They haven't, while we... Th objectively know they need a comeback at least on a lip service level they have been able to pretend up to this point that it was just shifting career paths okay we got kicked off star wars no we didn't get kicked off star wars we shifted to netflix they have done nothing else of note in the past four years this is their last chance that if you thought, oh no, they were already they weren't defeated. The fact that they have a two hundred million dollar project means there was no accountability, there was no reckoning in the industry. That our complaints are meaningless. Point is, what if, you know, just if, three body problem officially flops. 
they have set a very high bar for it to succeed, that they need it to succeed. Bradley said this needs to be their comeback. Up to now, they're able to play off everything else as shifting goals. If this fails, they there is no way they can hide being a failure again. No one could defend this and would actually start people investigating, I mean, mainstream news investigating what is going on with these guys on the scale of the past 15 years. They have set too high of a bar. It reminds me of... I don't mean to insult Lord of the Rings by way of comparison to them. Lord of the Rings' Rings of Power, I think, was unfairly bashed because they set their own bar too high. Well, that is my criticism, that Amazon said, this is the most expensive show ever, and it'll literally be as popular as Game of Thrones at its height. That this will be water-cooler TV that's trending on Twitter, that everyone talks about at The Office. And I was expecting it to be god-awful, because I thought there wasn't that much source material, and I saw it and went... You know, as a, as a hardcore Tolkien fan, this isn't really that bad. I mean, they had to make up fanfic to fill in gaps, but it, it, it was a presentable TV show. It wasn't like a mega flop where they're, like, filming action scenes in, in darkness or major continuity errors with coffee cups and things or invented rape scenes. You know, it, it was presentable. It was an effort. And I hope they do better in season two. I mean, Wheel of Time measurably did better in its second season, also from Amazon. Maybe Lord of the Rings will get better. It's just... I understood, knowing that there isn't a lot of source material, this isn't going to be great out of the gate. But by like two or three seasons into it, I can see them finding their footing. Potentially, right? So I actually had, unlike, you know, because I had expected so much failure, I had a higher tolerance for that. But the sad thing is, uh, Lord of the Rings, by their own standards, they failed. Because they weren't as popular, that even if they got like... I'm making up numbers. If they got 500 million views, but they thought they would get a billion views, that's still one of the most f top five viewed shows of the year, but it's still v very falling below what you thought, or that it didn't do well at award shows at all. They genuinely thought it would. Think I didn't think so. You know, even Lord of the Rings, the movies didn't do that. Well, it's not really that kind of thing, but... Well, they did not in the acting categories. It was more of an ensemble thing, that's what I mean. Point is, the reason people think Amazon's Lord of the Rings is a failure is because they, they set their own bar too high. That nothing less than greatness would be fulfilling their goal. And even when it was good and presentable, it was still short of their goals. The same thing is going on with Benioff and Weiss for Three Body Problem. They have set this as their comeback. The smarter move would have been to shift to doing a couple of smaller scale shows. One shot, one season shows, more than one, like a mystery show. A couple of them in succession. And use that to rebuild your credibility. I mean, like, people don't like Ryan, uh, people are against Ryan Johnson after Last Jedi. He went and did some one-shot mystery movies that were well-crafted enough to show I'm a decent movie maker, I'm a decent director. He didn't go off and go, I'm going to try to make something that matches the success of Star Wars. He went to do other projects just to demonstrate I'm capable of this. Many often wise have done nothing else. And they bet the farm on this one giant project. All of their eggs are in one basket, you know? And it's, the three-body problem can't just be a reasonably successful show. They need it to be the next Lord of the Rings. They need it to be the next Game of Thrones scale show. Anything short of that will be failure. That not only do they need a comeback, th that you don't try to make a big comeback and double down on it. You make smaller things. A couple of smaller things. That's the other big problem I'm going to talk about. They signed a multi... Sh and they talk about in the article. They signed a multi-show development deal, should have made other projects before this, but didn't, and all of their efforts just went into this one really big expensive show. And the false promise of, no, this will make up for everything, this will make up for everything. Everything now hinges on this one show, and it can't just be good. It has to be mind-blowingly the show of the year. Even compared to House of the Dragon Season 2. Or, um, Star Wars actually has an off year this year, but, um, Lord of the Rings Season 2 is coming out. Fallout is coming out. Other major shows. This is one of the top ten shows that people are anticipating, not looking forward to, but anticipating this is a potential to be one of the top ten. 
this needs to be the winner. Anything short of perfection. And just the stupidity of the planning on this, that you don't make one giant roll of the dice. It's the reason that when you go to a casino, you don't bet your entire house and life savings on one winning hand. You make smaller bets. I'm using a casino analogy that, no, I... And I've even worked out the math on this blackjack hand, that the, the, so many cards have been played, there is a good chance I could win it all back with this one hand. What if you don't? If you bet it all on this one big thing that you cannot afford to fail, never put yourself in that position in the first place. So yes, this was the return of the Benioff and Weiss show. It's like a time capsule that they came back from 2019 as if nothing had happened after Austin Film Fest a week later. They are still the same exact style of stuff with Hibbard, where they're gaslighting, act really confident, act... Oh, I don't even remember those criticisms deflecting. This is a performance. But the difference is it ends with stupidly, even Bradley, trying to get sympathy, Bradley admitting, actually, they really need this. Or they, they, Benioff and Weiss act like, oh, the season 8 criticism didn't affect us. From a pragmatic business standpoint, while they say season eight, you know, it didn't sweep the Emmys. They got best drama, they got an acting award for Peter Dinklage because people like Dinklage, but that they didn't get best writers and best director, even they submitted themselves for best directors, but that they didn't get best writing personally was a major blow, and you could see it in his eyes when they were doing the post Emmy QA that he was rattled that they didn't sweep the Emmys in every category they were nominated, particularly for writing, was a measurable blow to Benioff's career. That you don't just blow off, I got kicked off of Star Wars after spending over a year hyping up, I'm going to make the next big trilogy of this uh, as a prequel. He is playing off how bad this is. But behind the scenes, they know this is their last chance they knew season eight. They even said, like, in that stupid inside the episode they hid, we know that... It, I have, again, I posted that separately. It's on my top videos. Where he starts the inside the episode for the final episode going, we knew that if season eight didn't pull the whole show together, everything would be a failure. That they know. They are rattled. They are not confident. They are con men who are increasingly cornered. Thank you for listening this long. It just they haven't been on. They haven't been public for four years. I needed to go over it. But the Benioff and Weiss show, the meta show, is back. This is the longest one of these. But to give them more attention, I'm splitting off. This is the first of seven videos. The other ones are like ten minutes each. One on uh, Star Wars. They talked about another. They talked about Confederate, and then four separate issues where they talked about Three Body Problem itself, which I want to give more focus on individually.